Hello, and thank you for joining me again today on the Finding Hope After Loss podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Please leave a review or a rating on Apple or Spotify if you like the show. So I wanted to start off by giving a grief tip at the beginning of each episode, and I really hope that you will find these helpful. Today, I wanted to talk about something that may sound simple, but it's something I think is super important, and that is naming your baby. Giving your baby a name can make them feel more connected to you. You get to pick a meaningful name, and then you're also able to hear others say that name when referring to your baby. Many people think that they were too early, or they didn't know the sex of the baby, so therefore they can't really give the baby a name. But you can always opt for a gender-neutral name if you don't know the sex, such as Taylor or Casey. You can also refer to your baby as Baby A, Baby B, Baby Your Last Name, or even by a nickname. And nicknames can be something that remind you of your baby, or even something like the size of your baby at the time of your loss, such as Poppy. As many of you know, my daughter's name is Jasmine Grace. My husband and I were having trouble coming up with a name we both liked, and I had a dream one night that we named her Jasmine. I woke up and I told my husband, and he really likes the name, so this is how we actually came up with her first name. And then we both just liked the name Grace as a middle name, so she became Jasmine Grace. And it was really nice having a name for her that we could refer to her during the pregnancy, and this was even before we knew we would lose her, and then we had that name already picked out when she was born. And there's no timeline for naming your baby. If your loss was a year, two years, three years ago, you can always decide to still name your baby. So that's my tip for today. Name your baby. I promise whatever name you choose will be absolutely perfect. Today I am talking with Alexandra, who is a death doula that also runs a death doula training school. Alexandra suffered from PCOS and endometriosis and was never able to have children. This episode contains so much great information that Alexandra has to share about grief and death. Hello everyone, today I am here with Alexandra. Alexandra, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I certainly can, thank you. Um, I am Alexandra Derwin. I am based in North Wales in the United Kingdom, in the mountains. I work as a death doula and I run a death doula training school, uh, like a not-for-profit, a social enterprise, which offers community development and education around death, dying and grief. And between that and caring for my ageing mother and uh, looking after two dogs (laughs) and a cat, that keeps me pretty busy. That does sound very busy. Do you like to go out like outdoors and explore the mountains or are you an outdoor person at all? Yeah, I think that's why I settled here. I was living in London for a a good few years and I was always seeking out the green spaces. But um, we initially relocated up to North Wales to look after my then partner's mother who was dying. And this is where I'm from. And the nature and the space and frankly, the lower cost of living than the big cities makes it makes it ideal for me. Yeah. So yeah, just, just come back in from a massive long walk with the dogs. It's a bit hot for that. So the dogs are panting next to me. <laughs> I hope <laughs> <can't> hear them. <laughs> At least they'll be tired, right? <laughs> Better than them jumping on me. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of dogs do you have? Two Labradors. <laughs> yeah. We have a, she's a mix, but she's, she's a mess. <laughs> That's all I can say about her. <laughs> So can you uh, talk a little bit about, I think you said, or you mentioned that you have um, PCOS and endometriosis. Can you talk a little bit about like how you were diagnosed with that or how that's impacted your life? Oh my goodness. I mean, impacted my life is like understatement of the century. It's so formative for me to, um, to, when I think back, not that I realized it at the time, but so, so much of my journey in terms of my relationship to my body my relationship to my womanhood, although I would identify these days as non-binary, but it that's connected, like that is connected because 
I feel like, and you have to take or leave this, but because this has been my journey, but I really feel the endometriosis to be something ancestral. Um, it really feels like it's coming down the mother wound because it, it, relatively recently, I it kind of just, it just dropped into my head. This womb lining that is uh, at large within my body cavity, it's not mine, is it? Like that's what's that was the residue of what was in my mother's womb when I was forming and it it remained trapped in the place where it shouldn't be. And so when I'm bleeding and I'm bleeding internally with the endometriosis, it feels like ancestral trauma. Like I, I go very deep into it. And um, so how was I diagnosed? I would just say that I had a very distant relationship with my mother growing up. She never spoke to me about periods or anything like that. So I got the most basic of education at school. And when my period started, I was so shocked at how painful they were. I was like, how how can they be this painful <laughs> and people still function? But it never occurred to me at that point. I was young. Um, I just used to just medicate, you know, over the counter, pay medication, do my best. But frankly, I was getting to the point of dreading, like dreading my period every month. And I was also, well, from certainly from an age of about seven or eight, I was sugar addicted. I was a big sugar binger. And I, that's also connected um, because, wow, I mean, the amount of sugar that I could put away, I was a large child as a result of that. Um, my father was an alcoholic. He died when I was 14. And um, I don't know if I should have said that he was an alcoholic. Not I. I have. I have come to understand his life backwards because I lost him as a child, and and the, the way that I've made sense of it was that he too was sugar addicted and alcoholic, and um and from that point forward, I had eating disorders uh, where I would binge eat, and then I would go through long periods of dieting, and then eventually that developed into bulimia, and under eating, and anorexia, and over exercising, and orthorexia, the the kind of clean eating. Oh my god! So my weight was, you know, I, I was, I was much larger and then I'd get very skinny and I was on a, a sugar roller coaster a lot of the time and then my hormones started to fluctuate you know as a result of that really that the the binge eating disorder and the and the hormones went together and when I was in my early 20s I was at university and I started to grow a beard and I was not happy about that at all <laughs> it was bad enough for me to be in a much larger body than I felt comfortable and then I started to grow this thick, wiry black beard. <laughs> and I went to the doctor then. And the first couple of doctors dismissed me. They said, you know, I said, I said, I, I'm 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 big and I'm hairy. Do you think I might have PCOS? And they were like, well, some people might just be big and hairy. That could just be you. And I felt very dis like disregarded in that moment because clearly I, I, I was really seeking help. But then in, in later on in my 20s, probably um, mid 20s, I was holding down a career at that time pretty good career but incapacitated by my menstrual cycle my periods and then um yeah I started having investigations and then it turned out that I did have PCOS which makes losing weight more difficult but I wasn't helping the weight thing with the um, binge eating um and it was I came into recovery for eating disorders at the end of my 20s and I'm 43 now uh, and so since 29 I've been in eating disorder recovery and that did really bring like the, I, I suppose the the abstaining from the the sugar rushes and the highs and the lows and the roller coaster of all of that that did help to an extent but I noticed that my periods became more painful I was really hoping that perhaps they'd become less so I actually had investigations in my early 30s um and they suggested that I might have endometriosis as well and then I had surgery for that again maybe it was about 11 12 years ago where when they went in to investigate it was through keyhole surgery they went in to investigate the endometriosis and found that my there was lots of adhesions at the bowel where my bowel was stuck to my stomach wall which may not have been helped by the bulimic behavior but, but um so i had the, the through the keyhole surgery they released a lot of those adhesions and removed a lot of the endometriosis and then i had a a good long good few years of relative normality and then sort of as I turn 40 and I'm heading into the perimenopause I'm starting to see a return of the endometri endometriosis symptoms which I largely manage through a combination of 
sort of Western medicine and alternative medicine. And I certainly schedule my life now around my cycle, which is unpredictable, but there's a kind of window where I would be less likely to put any major events. <laughs> and I try to keep it clear. So at the point at which I came into eating disorder recovery, I was at that point infertile. Um, and I had also been told I was pre-diabetic. So my body was really struggling with the eating disorders. Um, and then there was a, a return to a regular cycle. So I celebrated the return of my fertility, but then went through the endometriosis journey in my 30s and sort of emerged from that feeling past the point. Like, I know it's it's not the, it's not about age these days, really. But that po a point in my mid 30s, there was a turn where I started to realize that perhaps having children wasn't in my gift in this lifetime this time around um and I I grieved that so you know like so deeply I mean the, the the kind of grief that I've touched around childlessness and people say I'm child childless by choice and I'm thinking no I think if I'd had a choice I would have wanted children but then it wasn't within my gift so I, I kind of feel like I don't want to be a victim of it so <laughs> I'm child free I'm childless I don't know but um, I've, I've come to accept it and integrate it and recognize that perhaps my work in the world in this in this incarnation is is my creative expression but um yeah there was so much grief in me when I yeah I realized that I wasn't in a, the right place financially or relationship wise or in my head you know I, I just it never it never came around and now I'm 43 I'm single I've recognized I'm non-binary which is fine that doesn't mean I couldn't have children but it's it changes the search for another do you know what I mean like it really right. really does yeah it's not like it's not like I'm um my dating profile <laughs> is rather unusual if you think about it I'm sober I I'm I work with death and I'm non-binary and I'm like <laughs> it's, it's going to be a very specific human being that that I end up hooking up with <laughs> well yeah you have certainly been through a lot and you know definitely I think it's so different when you're able, like you said, to make that choice to not be able to have kids rather than just have it taken from you. Yeah. You can imagine there was definitely a lot of, a lot of grief around that. Huge amount of grief and a real reckoning and wrestling with my own victim mentality. Like why me, poor me, oh, this is shit. Like, this is my story. I'm so hard up. Can't believe this. You know, a lot, I, I, I needed to honor that. <laughs> And I needed to transcend that because I was forever in the negative. I, I, I'd actually get a little triggered sometimes around my friend, my friends having babies and they're all like, let's have a baby shower. And I'm like, oh, let's not. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and I love, I absolutely love children, but I would, I would find myself in, you know, being thrown into a real kind of feeling like for some reason, because I wasn't doing life like they were doing life that I my my version of life was less than and the circles I move in are quite kind of earth mothery you know like there's quite a lot of um crunchy barefoot you know breastfeeding you know all of that sort of stuff and I and I am a birth doula as well so I've been at a lot of lot of births home births natural births nor most of the time so that community that I move in like there's such a connection between womanhood motherhood and success and um and unpacking that without dimming like a lot of the hostility towards me when I became non-binary because they thought I was disrespecting womanhood or something or my own womanhood or that I had a problem with being feminine or something like that and I was like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. this is a very fragile very fragile concept if it can be so challenged by someone's own identification of gender like actually maybe I am just this non-binary soul in a female body with all of these menstrual fertility problems and that's my path you know not less than anyone else but I certainly felt like I, I would regularly go home from gathering with my friends and their babies and just cry myself to sleep just going I am just not succeeding in life like this is what's my life about I'm not having babies and that's hard too you know it seems like I guess society makes it where, you know, you're supposed to live your life one way. You're supposed to, you know, go to school, get married, have babies, you know, like th that's what you're supposed to do. And anybody who doesn't do that thing is somehow, uh, I don't know the right word, not like weird, but you mm -hmm. know, like that, that's what I feel like people think about it. And that's 
you know, definitely not true. No, no, it's not true. And I think, I think the thing is that that the women's rights and the celebration of motherhood, and it's, I mean, that's still ongoing, isn't it? We don't have equality yet. So the fight to recognize the value of motherhood and to, you know, to bring e- equality and equity to the, to the gender difference there, that because that's still recent, ongoing, and hard won, then it can also be fragile. It's still that that sense of valuing motherhood because so many of my friends who are mothers will say that they feel forgotten about, excluded, lonely, um, isolated, overwhelmed, unsupported. And I hear them, I'm like, I hear you. I'm like, how can I, how can I be a better friend? I wanna come and support you and help. So it's this strange thing where motherhood is somehow on the one hand, really the kind of epitome of womanhood and and what it is to be a successful woman is to be a a really good mom and then on the other hand not respected at all in other in other areas of society so it's it's so complex yeah really complex yeah it's definitely one of those things like you know you're damned if you do damned if you don't you know I think it's a it is a feminist issue in the sense that surely we shouldn't have to argue one one way or the other that we're valuable human beings or that we're a success of otherwise it's it's don't they're not men having this problem do we <laughs> <laughs> I definitely agree <laughs> so how yeah. long have you um been a doula well it's a good question because certainly as a birth doula uh about 12 years because my friend's a lot of them who said they were never going to have children, like this was probably why I was bonded with them, because we were never going to be able to have children or have children. They all started having babies in, in our 30s. Um, so, yeah, apart from a couple of friends who had babies in their 20s, most of my friendship group seemed to all just get pregnant at the same time in, in our early 30s. And um, uh, initially it was one of my very, very good friends uh, who I'd known for since childhood, really since we were teenagers she wanted me at her second birth her first birth hadn't gone quite to plan and um, she wanted me at her second birth I hadn't really heard the term doula before um, but she said that I was solid that's how she described me you're a really solid presence and I would just love for you to be there and I went and had this incredible very bloody (laughs) very but cosmic induction into the world of birth without any knowledge or I just showed up and just was just in service of whatever she needed and I I got it that my job was to be alongside her and to to support her whatever and it was only after that that I was uh, working as a chef like I was catering in a retreat center as part like a side hustle and there was a group of doulas on retreat birth doulas this is and I said to them oh I've been at a birth and they said oh maybe you were a birth doula but you know I was like "Mm." and um and because I was getting asked and lots of my friends were pregnant I thought I'll go and do a training just so because I've never been pregnant um I don't know what I'm doing (laughs) so I went and did a birth doula training but it was then really that it kind of lots of pennies started dropping like penny dropping penny dropping penny dropping oh goodness me like everything that comes into play in terms of birth doulaship it's exactly the same as caring for the dying. And when I think about it, I've been at that. I'm much longer. Like even before my father died, when I was 14, I was already very tuned in. I was I was sort of always on that wavelength of grief and loss and death. And there was quite a lot of grief in my family, even before I was born. So I felt on that frequency. Then my father died when I was 14. I had a really profound experience being with him in the space after death. Um, and that, that that thread of caring for the dying and the bereaved went right the way through all the jobs I'd ever done, all the work I'd ever done. There'd always been death in there. And I kind of went when I was doing the birth doula course, I reckon I'm a death doula. And um, and that the two seemed wholly compatible, like maybe they seem like opposites to a lot of people, but certainly not to your listeners, I'm sure, because <laughs> the topic of your podcast. But the two just seemed wholly connected and I I do not specialize per se but I have done a lot of work with people who've gone for a, a conscious termination of pregnancy or um people who've miscarried difficult word but you know or, or I've, I've attended to families where babies have died stillborn or cop death and this uh, so 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 many that it's part of it's part of the work that I do in the world is is to tend tend to baby 
death and loss. And um, so the two do overlap, right? There's a birth and a death in the same space, it, wh whichever way, even if, even if we're talking about baby death and loss, yes, but actually in all death, there's a birth and in all birth, there's a loss, you know, there's, it's, the two are so deeply and intrinsically connected as, as, as almost a singular rite of passage, like first breath and last breath and the space in between. Yeah. It's life. Right. But uh, it's, it's phenomenal. And um, just in claiming that for myself, I started to look around at, you know, I think this is quite a modern phenomenon. Like, okay, I think I need to train like this. I, I might be a death doula. Maybe I need to train as one, but I'm already just decided I am one. And I looked around at what was available and saw with no judgment or criticism of, of the trainings that are out there. I just, just wasn't my kind of learning. It wasn't my kind of, um, style and that just sowed a seed at that point of doing the birth doula course maybe maybe I could if I don't put myself out there to be an expert and just humbly offer myself as a facilitator allow death to be the teacher I don't need to be the teacher I don't need to know stuff just facilitate it I wonder what might happen and then <laughs> that experiment has actually turned out to be huge huge so I uh, think seven years I've been at the death doula training courses and it's now getting pretty global and scaling up and it's, it's big, it's a big deal. And I've That's written amazing. three books. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> I've got to write the books. I've I had guess to you never saw yourself doing that, right? Like <laughs> you're like, I'm just going to start here. And then exactly. it grew into something bigger than you could have imagined. I could never, if you had told me that this is where I'd end up even now and I, and I hasn't even finished yet. Like seven years in we're just at the point of scaling and in essence that's like a that's like the birth it's not it's it's just like we've been gestating for seven years right we're just about to get big um in in 10 15 years time I'll look back at this threshold that I'm on and going wow I honestly thought I honestly thought that I was content and the work was going well before and then look at where we're at today um but yeah, I, I never, when I was a child, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, you know, I actually said when I was seven, everyone else was saying they wanted to be a farmer or a doctor or something like that. And I said, I want to be secretary general of the United Nations <laughs> when I was seven years old. Ambitious. I know. Um, I mean, not least because you need a law degree. <laughs> There's no way in my field. Um, but more than anything, I wanted to bring peace that's what I've realized I've done it you know I've looked back at that seven-year-old precocious child going I want to be secretary general of the United Nations and I just saw that role on television as being like the the bringer of peace in my head and that's that's what motivates me still you know really that that by remembering and reclaiming the sacredness of birth and death and that you know, there's opportunities for us to transcend our differences and find peace that's kind of so I'm nowhere near the United Nations. <laughs> but, but you're the, doing very important work helping people find peace. I mean, you know, there, there's not that many people out there that are comfortable enough to even do anything surrounding death. You know, it's kind of that that subject like, oh, no, no, I don't I don't want to go near that, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And thank you for saying that, because I increasingly I'm moving in circles. I'm in an, I'm in an echo chamber, really, a lot of the time, because so many people have been drawn to befriend me on facebook or follow me on social media or you know the people that i surround myself with that are largely comfortable with death because of the ongoing nature of the work and then and then every now and again i step into sort of another space you know i i was giving a talk at a conference at the university on friday gone last friday and i was really just i i was not shocked but reminded it was a sharp reminder that people do not think like i do or or face the topic like I do. Uh, there's an enthusiasm and a joy and a lightness with which I speak about death and loss mm -hmm. and grief that people, that, that they don't, if to the uninitiated, it sounds like I'm not taking it seriously, but actually the more and more and more I've been with the dying, the sat with the dead, helped the bereaved, been with people through huge grief, huge loss, huge trauma. And the more and more and more I've done that, the lighter in myself and the easier I find life in general even even when it's really difficult there's still a, a there's still a sacredness or a kind of presence that comes when just realizing how finite it all is and and that there's joy to be found in the moment so 
to the uninitiated they might find me irreverent the way that I might joke about something or I I call I call things by their proper name I don't bother with euphemisms I'm just straight up and um, I've just found that being sort of open-hearted honest straight loving but also that kind of earnest heaviness that comes with people who and this is the conference was talking to people who work with dying that it was a palliative and end of life care conference <laughs> but it was there was lots of oh you know oh sadness oh tragic oh we can't call it we, we, we know passed over or rather mm-hmm. um and so much of the theater that goes around our system's way of coping about with death and dying is all about protecting people from its rawness whereas for me I'm like get right in the middle of that raw because in that then there's such beauty I mean grim beauty but like humanness there's such humanity and real yeah real gems of of what it is to be really human to be found right in the heart of those things which people avoid because it's sad it's tragic it's grim it's um depressing and I'm like it is only those things if a you as an individual avoid them and won't talk about them but it's more of a collective issue it's not you know if one person can't go near their grief or they're terrified of death I'm not going to judge them that's a symptom of a societal breakdown and you know a loss of community so that people aren't supported well enough and so it's not so much encountering grief or encountering death that people are frightened of it's that it's they're frightened that they'll be alone with that and that, that that they'll open a door they can't close and that 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 then they'll be lost to it it's the oblivion and the annihilation of that path that terrifies people and I'm like come back come back from that brink and let's get into a circle let's sit down and let's establish light a fire put the kettle on sit down together and then human beings can deal with and process far more than we think when we do so together it's it's the it's the loneliness and the isolation of our current our modern world that exacerbates that fear of death I think that is such a good point I mean especially I found with you know having lost a child and and in the people that I know who have lost babies I mean death is something people don't want to talk about the death of a baby is something people don't want to talk about even more. Yeah. Yeah. And did and you think, find people, even people who were close to you, did, did you find that they just crossed the road? Just Yeah. I mean, um, my family was supportive, you know, my, my immediate family. And, um, but yeah, there, there are some people who I thought would be there for us that were not. And then there was, you know, people who just acquaintances that would reach out and be like, the biggest supporter and you're like wow I mean it I feel like death just really shows you like who's there for you and who's not but sometimes I've, I've come to learn that it's not always that they don't want to be there it's just that they can't for whatever reason totally. you know kind of like you were talking about they can't handle the grief it's beyond it's beyond comprehension for some people and a, a lot of people project in my experience I don't know for sure but a lot of people project that baby death baby loss is like the like that's the limit of human endurance and and for for some people it genuinely is and yet my experience of supporting people through that process there's still there's still the gems in the darkness it, it's not it's that's not me trying to make it into roses and sweetness it's it's, it's really effing difficult and there's some extraordinary beauty that i've seen in the grieving and in the bond and the love that continues beyond death and the the continued relationship the the oxytocin the mothering instinct that that sustains through death it's it has been it has been the most utter privilege to witness and one of the things that I get messaged all the time like I try to redirect people to my website now but a lot of people reach out to me by messenger you know through social media and they will tell me so and so is dying or my friends lost a child or you know and they say I just do not know what to say what should I say I I don't know how to help them what can I do and it's remarkable I mean I'm talking maybe 100 people a week contacting me like a lot to the point where I'm like whoa okay this is a thing like we are so terrified and I don't know if it it might be a British thing because the (laughs) British are very very frightened like it's the ultimate 
it's the ultimate social taboo is to put your foot in it. I don't know if you had that saying, put your foot in it, you know, to <laughs> just say the wrong thing to just yeah, I was just like, put your foot in your mouth. <laughs> exactly. Like nothing kills a British person more than putting your foot in your mouth. Right. So it's, so we would rather almost abandon a decent friendship or a relationship than actually sit and talk to that person and get it wrong. And it's the getting it wrong that terrifies people because they can't imagine the kind of pain that this person is going through with this loss. And to think that they might make it worse is so in a way, the not that it makes it easier to be the receiving end of that isolation, but there's love and care in the avoidant behavior because it's like, I don't want to make it worse. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to harm you. I don't want to make it about me. I don't want to, you know, all of this. So people have got process in the avoidance. And I've, I, my counsel to people is always the same. It's, it's the, it's just, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do, but I am here for you. Right. And then show up, like just show up and admit, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. My heart's breaking for you. I don't want to make it about me, but I am having big feelings. <laughs> um, but I'm in service of you. What do you need? What, what and, and and I will you know I'm I'm here in your service that's that's the way to go right because better to have someone admit they have no idea what they're doing and still try yes. than to just never get in touch I think people think that you know like you said that saying the wrong thing is worse than saying nothing but really it's the opposite it's when you say nothing and disappear that it hurts more because at least if you say the wrong thing, you know, like we know you're trying, even though it may not be what we want to hear, you know, but yeah, the disappearing and the not saying anything is what hurt me more than people saying the wrong thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's huge. And I suppose that, I mean, I don't know, but I I can imagine in the, in the, my, in my care role with my mother, right? Not comparable. And yet... <laughs> So I've been caring for her almost full time since since COVID, since 2020. And I don't have the mental energy to form, like to keep my friendships going. Like I'm just so tired and I'm grief stricken and it's difficult. And I've got so much going on that I feel like I'm a bad friend because I'm not able to make up my end of it. And then if my friends aren't getting in touch with me, I don't have the energy to bridge. It's like, it takes a lot of energy, like a, it's like breaking an orbit. To break out of grief and isolation, to, it takes a lot to reach out yourself through that. And you yourself, I myself might not know. I might not know what I need. Yeah. I might not even want company. I just don't, I might not even want that. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not culturally normal, but it should be for people to say, hey, I'm just reaching out. You might not want company. You might not want anything, but just know I'm still here and I'm thinking of you. And then it's nice. Yeah, that's definitely, you know, like, like you said, I didn't always know what I wanted after, after our losses too. Sometimes I was like, I know exactly what I need, but Hey, there's nobody here to, you know, to sit with me. I mean, my husband was there, my mom, my dad, you know, those kind of people, but um, yeah, it, it's grief is so much more complicated than, you know, than people even think it is. Mm -hmm. What would you have, what would you have wished for from your friends? The ones that, the ones that disappeared, like what would have been their best? Exactly offer? what you said. Just a, I'm here. If you need me, I'm here. If you need to talk, you know, that's, that's all I wanted just to know that people were there um, because I feel like people who, who didn't say anything, it's like they were pretending like it didn't happen or pretending like she didn't exist. And I'm like, she was, you know, I was 32 weeks with her. Like I held her in my arms. She was a real person. She had a name. I gave birth to her, you know, and by you, I guess, not saying her name, not acknowledging it, it just kind of feels like they weren't acknowledging her, which was hurtful to me. Yeah. Yeah. And what was her name? Jasmine. Jasmine. Of course, because this <laughs> whole podcast is about Jasmine. And actually I, um, her name came to me in a dream one night, you know, we were having a lot of trouble, um, naming her, my husband and I weren't agreeing on names. And, um, I just dreamed that we named her that. And I woke up and told him and he was like, I love it. Let's name her that. And so that was, that was her name. Yeah, it's a beautiful name. It really is a beautiful name. It's very evocative to me of sort of summer evenings with the scent of Jasmine on the breeze and the beauty of it. It's really 
Thank you. I, I love it too. And then I've had two um, other daughters since then, and I chose to give them also um, floral names. So they kind of all tie together in a way, like kind of my way of uniting them. Mm. Yeah. Do you like it when, um, if somebody came to you and said, uh, I mean, I don't know, you might have taken photographs or, mm. you know, mementos. If people bring, if you, people bring Jasmine up now, mm. is it ever inappropriate? You know, is there ever, ever a part of you that's like, I really wish you hadn't brought brought her up or if somebody does is it more like oh thank you for thank you for remembering uh, most of the time I appreciate it there yeah. are a couple of times where um, my son has brought it up in conversations when I wasn't like when we were at the orthodontist or at the you know at somewhere and I'm like oh okay I didn't really want to talk about that right now because then people give you that look you know that oh yeah exactly and you're like I'm pulling the face <laughs> and then it's just kind of like okay well I mean I'm glad he remembers her but didn't really want to talk about that right now but most of the time I appreciate people bringing her up mm. that's certainly been you know people I've worked alongside that that's been that's been the case is that you can never really you know best more is better than less if you're going to they can always say to you no I don't want to talk about it or I don't want to but better to ask or better to observe or to you know to remember and they can say thank you for remembering um I'm not I don't really need to talk about it right now but right people will because I think after a year two years three years still with you right the the mm. loss is still with you but everybody else moves on and exactly um, again I think that's a collective uh, responsibility I think you know as communities in society we totally need to have more spaces of remembrance, you know, reg regular memorials and places where we can go and, you know, light a candle, place a photo. Perhaps some people, are, you know, that would be church for some people, but it isn't for everybody. And right. um, and those practices of community memorial and and tracking, like I've got friends, um, friends of mine whose parents were immigrants, you know, different cultures, Middle Eastern, sort of North African and Mediterranean cultures and they track like that's a cultural thing when somebody has a a, a loss or somebody dies there is a, a tracking of the, the community will memorialize it three months six months 12 months and then every year thereafter it's done as part of their culture and I think god what a loss what a loss to, what a loss it is to those of us who I suppose don't have that lineage to to have nothing nothing just to be just to be okay you go back to go back to your life now what and that's life? how I feel it is here in the U.S. I mean it's like okay well sorry but let's get back to normal now so we don't have to talk about it and you know let's just move on and you're going to be okay right like yeah whereas not really <laughs> no not really not really like like this there's, there's something there's such a disconnect yeah a massive disconnect where we're just like back on the horse <laughs> so do you um do you work with men as well like fathers of of the babies or is it mostly the mothers that you work with um bit of both it depends where the, where there has been um baby born stillborn or died early on or stillbirth then I'm working with the family like uh, there's usually other children partner and mother personally birthed um in the sort of pregnancy loss or conscious release of pregnancy no it tends to be one-to-one -one with the, with the mother I really like that you that you use that term the conscious release of pregnancy I think that sounds a lot better than the than the termination term that you so often hear yes and um that, that came to me it was about 10 years ago uh I met a young a young person who was like in their seventh or eighth pregnancy they're very vulnerable very very vulnerable really you know the they they hadn't been allowed to keep their previous children they they were with the fathers you know it was one of those pregnancies where you're just like oh no mm -hmm. and she was um really wrestling with because she hadn't been allowed to keep, you know, I don't know if this would happen in America, but in the UK, social services had re removed the children from her. And um, yeah, 
So she was desperate. She wanted this baby because she wanted to keep a baby. Looking, even you know, she herself looked at the evidence and was recognizing that she may not be in the strongest position to be a mom. And um, and the pregnancy had gone on quite late. And she was in such turmoil and I sat with her and she just, what mattered to her was that this baby knew it was loved. And, um, and I said to her, if you were to consider consciously releasing this pregnancy, is that an act of love? And she said, yeah, that's, that was the turning point for not that I talked her into it or talked her out of it. <laughs> but that she saw it as an act of love because she'd be bringing another child that she couldn't at that point in her life look after um, into a world of struggle. And so it was, it was a, an act, it was an act of love and that was how she saw it. And in, when that landed in her, she knew what she needed to do. And so I'm not in the position, I'm never ever in the, in a place of advising but I am in the place, if I can, of removing shame. I'm just like, whatever decision somebody makes for themselves, it's got to be honoured. Because shaming somebody is not the answer. And we don't have the same trouble over here. Um, I know in America, there's lots of changes to abortion laws and what a travesty, as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, sit sitting here in my privilege, we don't have that problem of it, of it being... Um, ever illegal or even contested we do have mm -hmm. systems in place um but it doesn't mean that people don't absolutely go through a moral ringer in terms of right decision wrong decision it's so for a lot of people a counterintuitive thing to do but it is it is loving if you know if, if they can find the place where it's the most loving act for them then it can be transformed from a trauma um into yeah, it'll be inevitably traumatic, but not as big as it is if you're not allowed to talk about it and you're shamed about it and you feel like you killed somebody in, in all of the stories that run around it. So, um, so yeah, I, it's difficult as a doula trainer. I do, um, you know, I put the kind of pol policy in there that whichever country in the world we are, doulas have to work within the law. You know, we have to honour the law of the country and I don't, I don't suggest that anyone goes off and breaks the law um but i am working within the laws of my country so. <laughs> so you said that now you've um expanded like kind of worldwide where um where all have you expanded to well i mean it's still in its kind of it's like a mushroom mushroom circles so i do a lot of traveling because uh partly because of the environmental impact of everybody flying to me you know if i'm going to sit still and everybody flies to me that's you know a couple of hundred people a year flying here rather than i could fly to them but also i go to an area where then the circle forms in that locality and um and when i leave they stay in touch and there's so i'm seeding community when i do that that's that's part of the theory about the traveling so because i'm based in the uk and and ireland is next door uh a lot of the work started off UK and Ireland and Ireland has, you know, it's really taken off there. Um, and then Netherlands uh, is also quite near the UK, but then there's been these exciting developments in Spain. Um, one of our very, very, very good um, practitioners took the course and went to her native Slovakia and started a training, like a sister school in Slovakia where she's trained hundreds of people so it's come, we've got a hub in Slovakia of um, of death and grief doulas which was interesting when the war broke out right because everybody all the refugees coming over over the borders um and felt good to me to think that we had a a, a good strong community there um I'm traveling to uh, uh South Africa in August and Ireland again in September and then you, I get invitations from all over the world. But the the thing about the invitation is I can't just go on the first invitation. Right? <laughs> Somebody says, oh, my God, you've got to come to, you know, wherever, <laughs> insert place. Here. Some amazing places I've been invited to. But until I get several invitations and it feels strong and I feel like, yeah, it's worth it, 
it can be a lot of work to to try to seed something if if it's just superficial interest mm-hmm. people say you really must bring it to brazil or whatever and we have had quite a strong invitation from brazil but you really ought to bring it to brazil and i'm like yeah it's going to need to reach some kind of critical mass before i <laughs> before i do come to brazil because right. it's a lot of work so there's been a lot of invitations um to canada and to the us um and i've been willing but I've also been waiting because there's actually some extremely good practitioners and teachers in America. Um, and Canada has, you know, in its own way, a very strong culture of um, community death care. So it may be that I'm not needed and I, I would only need to go to seed something um, when it's needed. And I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to try to be in competition with existing schools Um unless we could negotiate what it is that I bring being different and complementary, and then we could see it like that because I believe it is don't believe I am in competition with anybody I do have a particular brand as in a particular way and that is that's that's not just my way the the company's called sacred circle so we work in circle we, we work with stories and uh, nobody's the teacher There isn't anyone in charge. So it takes, it's actually quite skilled and nuanced facilitation. So I wouldn't want to say, oh, I don't do anything. (laughs) Or my facilitators, (laughs) I've trained, you know, a good good few facilitators now. And it's not that we're doing nothing. It's very nuanced facilitation to allow that to unfold. But we are primarily learning through story. Exactly as, you know, in you sharing what, what it is that you wanted your friends to say. If that was shared in a circle, then everybody learns from that. And we go away and we can share that with people and say, do you know what? It's it's better to say, I don't know what to do, but I'm here for you. And then it, it, it that's using your own personal experience and story as a way of teaching and sharing with others also brings meaning to, to the experience that you had. And it, it moves from being an untenable, unbearable tragedy into it was a trauma it's a it's an open wound and then the wound becomes a scar and then it's it is it, it it integrates over time when we're able to be of service to others in the name of that struggle and it's that is really it's what i'm seeing as as the death doula training grows these hundreds of people that have passed through now a lot of them were drawn by their own grief they weren't really so much about wanting to serve the dying or you know work in a hospice or whatever you know they just wanted to bring their stories into community and be heard and then we we will we will lament together um we'll we'll cry together and sing together and integrate it together and that just the power of that is enormous so i don't train i don't say here's a checklist of things you need to do as a death doula it's not like that although i mean vaguely it's there there is a curriculum of sorts we actually believe that if you do work through your grief and you know find your peace with it it doesn't mean that you have to get get over it I put that in inverted commas not that but that but that it comes into service of others and um and that we know that we're not alone and we and we face you know we work through our own relationship to death and our own mortality by extension we're then better placed to serve others. But we wouldn't want to be serving others until we've done that work on ourselves to, just mm-hmm. to make peace with what's what's living in our bodies as trauma and loss. I think that's that's such amazing thing that you're doing. I mean, you're you're reaching so many people and helping, you know, people to get through their grief and process their grief and then teaching them how to help others. So I think I think it's just amazing. You're doing so many good things. <laughs> Thank you. I needed to hear that today. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> I so doubt if, myself. Yeah. If but people no, I... wanted to find more information um, about you, where would they go to find that? Uh, well, the death doula work, you want to look at www.journeywithdeath.com. Journey with death. And that from there, you could find more information about me. I have my own website, which is Derwin, which is um, the name that I'm published under. So um, Alexandra Derwin but derwinroots.wales <laughs> that's my personal website and then yeah social media at journey with death well i want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on today and share a little bit about your story and about what you're doing mm, thank you for having me it's been uh, it's 
actually, I have done a lot of work on my grief, but I can feel the stirrings of it in this conversation. It, it continues to be, I think, one of those things that we should all be talking about more. So thank you for your work as well. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for sharing your story with us. I wanted to take a brief moment to touch on those who are childless, not really by choice. As Alexandra mentioned, it can be really hard for these people to find their place. They can feel less than because they weren't able to achieve motherhood of a living child. Many people have the goal of being a mother and never expect that they may not be able to actually achieve that goal. So I have two reminders for you. If you've lost a baby, no matter what gestation, you are still a mother. And the other reminder is that motherhood doesn't define you as a person. A positive pregnancy test does not define you. The ability to get pregnant or to carry a pregnancy to term does not define you. Yes, these are things that many of us want. But if you're not able to do this, it doesn't make you less than. It doesn't mean you're not good enough. It doesn't mean other people are doing life right and you're doing it wrong. It's just different. And sometimes we just get dealt a really crappy hand and we have to learn how to live with it. It's also okay if you have a hard time being around other people's kids. You don't have to be 100% happy all the time for everyone else and never give yourself the time to grieve. Take the space you need. Say no to the baby shower or to the birthday party. Take care of you and your needs first. It's not selfish. It's necessary. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Please leave a review or a rating on Apple or Spotify if you like the show. Thank you so much for tuning in and remember, we are all in this together.